sea can be one of the most hostile environments known to man. Storm winds, huge waves and salt water all take their toll on any structure, either here on the coast or out there. To cope with these threats, we've had to find solutions. In this programme, we investigate the gigantic floodgates protecting Rotterdam in the Netherlands. Visit the Troll offshore platform, the largest structure ever to be moved across the face of the earth. But we begin in Devon, southwest England. Plymouth is an historic naval city and fishing harbour in the southwest of England. It stands at the entrance to the English Channel in one of the most exposed corners in Britain, and therefore it's no surprise that for centuries its treacherous approaches have been protected by a number of lighthouses. We're off to the site of the famous Eddiston Lighthouse, which lies 14 miles out on the Eddiston Reef. The Eddiston Reef is the site of several historic lighthouses, and it's their changing designs that reflect our increasing ability to withstand the elements. There has been a lighthouse at Eddiston since 1699, but the ferocity of the weather in the channel has claimed three of them. Indeed, one was completely swallowed by the sea in Britain's worst ever storm in 1703. The present tower was built by James Douglas in 1882, but it's one of its predecessors, that of John Smeaton, that we're interested in. The first lighthouses on this site were built of wood. The men who built them advocated wood because of its flexible qualities, but they were either lost to sea or burnt down. John Smeaton's tower, built in the 1750s, was a much greater success. You can see the remains of Smeaton's Tower here, near the base of the new tower. The rest of it was taken back to the mainland, stone by stone, to be preserved. The current tower, now over a hundred years old, remains unscathed by the elements, but the reason for its survival can be attributed in part to the pioneering work of John Smeaton. This is the Smeaton Lighthouse, which was brought back from Eddiston Reef and rebuilt after it was decided that it be replaced by a taller tower. Smeaton proposed a building which was said to be based on the shape of an oak tree. He said, my main aim is to construct a tower whose every part should be strong in direct proportion to the stress it's likely to bear. Smeaton also pioneered new materials and construction techniques inventing a large crane for lifting the large stones from a boat moored next to the site. However, his major contribution was to recognize the importance of interlocking the stones to give the tower additional strength. The intricate shapes fitted together a bit like a jigsaw puzzle, using dovetail joints and iron and marble dowels to lock the whole structure together. The higher up the lighthouse you go, the thinner the walls become. They are made from a granite called moorstone, which is very dense and resistant to weathering. Here at the top of the lighthouse, the keepers would ensure the flame burned constantly throughout their long stays. This frame held the candles, one in each of the holes. Smeaton's tower on the Eddiston Reef was finished in 1759, three years after starting work, and its 24 candles burned in this lantern for over 100 years. In its day, it had to endure Force 12 storms, and at one time, according to the keeper in 1824, the water came from the top of the building in such quantities that we were overwhelmed. What finally overcame his structure was the rock it stood on. Storms undermined the rock foundations, and by 1877, Smeaton's Tower was finally retired. 
as an acknowledgement of his great achievement, the tower was rebuilt here on Plymouth Hoe. Lighthouses need to withstand the sea, but they could never claim to hold it back. For that, something truly amazing is required. To the east of the English Channel lies the North Sea coast of Holland. With much of the country below sea level, the Dutch live under the very real threat of disastrous flooding, and much of the coastline is protected by a series of fixed barriers and dikes. Rotterdam is the biggest port in Europe, and the problem for the government was how to protect the city from the might of the sea, while keeping its main waterway open for the hundreds of ships that pass down it every day. The solution was a pair of huge floodgates that in the event of an emergency will swing out into the waterway and meet in the middle, stopping the sea in its tracks. The barrier was opened in May 1997 at a cost of 400 million pounds and it's beautifully simple in its operation. It comprises two enormous identical gates which are floated out from dry docks into the river and sunk onto the river bed. This is the gate on the north side, and I'm walking along the sea wall. On my left is the giant truss that holds the wall in position and the joint that holds the whole gate to the shore. The sea walls are 210 meters long and 22 meters high. You can see about half of them here. The other half is down in the dry dock. They're hollow, so they can be floated out into the river like a ship where the two halves meet. Then they're ballasted with water and they sink to the riverbed. We're lucky today that the dry dock's empty, so we can get right down into the bottom and have a look at the shape of the seawall and how it's floated out. But it's pretty muddy down there, so I need some boots. One of the great advantages of the dry dock for this design is it means that the maintenance is much easier. Right, let's go. Fantastic. You can see right underneath it. Here we go. <laughs> If a storm surge arrives, then the whole dry dock is flooded, the wall floats up and is pushed out into the river. After the storm has passed, they float the wall back into the dock, sink it back onto its supports, pump the water out. The mud comes in when they open the gates as well. Let's try and see the shape of it a bit better. When it's out in the river, it sinks like this onto the seabed because, of course, it's held right back on the shore. So it's floated out, and then it sinks onto the seabed. And the great wall here provides the main barrier to the storm wave coming up the river. But when we get right underneath, the wall, we can see the ceiling edge where it sits on the bottom of the river. And this is it. This rubber piece here, which runs right along the bottom of the wall, is what sits onto the concrete sill at the bottom of the river. It gets squashed under the weight of the wall above. And it's sitting on pistons, so it can just squidge up a little bit and provide a really good seal underneath the whole wall. Behind the gate there is the river, way up there. And these great ports are where they let the water in to fill the dock.
Perhaps we'd better go. Let's go up onto the back of the wall and we can see how the force is taken out to the shore. Supporting the great sea wall is a huge truss. There are eight main struts which take most of the force from the sea and carry it directly along the arms into the foundation. Other smaller struts above provide bracing against the whole gate twisting. Each of the gates is the size of the Eiffel Tower lying down, but they weigh twice as much. The arms are made up of giant trusses, here made with cylindrical steel tube all welded together. The two great arms that hold the seawall meet here their great length and the huge forces in the members mean that they're susceptible to buckling, so the trusses are very deep and heavily braced. At the end of the gate, where the arms come together, is the pivot mechanism around which the whole gate moves. Wow, absolutely gigantic. The huge force from the seawall is carried down through that giant truss and ends up here on this knuckle enormous ball joint. It's 10 meters in diameter, the biggest ball joint in the world. Under a storm load, 35,000 tons of force arrive right here. <coughs> Climbing down inside the ball here. There we are. This is right inside the ball itself. It weighs 680 tons, and of course it can't be left just to sit on its socket uh, when it's not being used. So these great pistons, six of them, can lift the whole ball up when it needs to be painted. Keep your fingers out of there. The whole ball turns on these bearings here when the gate is closed, bringing the face of the ball into the great gray socket that you can see behind me. Under the storm force, there's a huge pressure on this face. The pressure on the face is the same as a submarine would feel 1,800 meters underwater, 6,000 feet down. That huge pressure is passed through the steel shoe and into the concrete foundation here. And the whole foundation would give about 200 millimeters when the gate is closed. It's absolutely amazing. Rotterdam's storm surge barrier is engineering on a grand scale, ingenious in concept, beautifully executed and immaculately maintained. But both our structures so far have been land-based. If we're talking about the sea, we'd better get out there. Off the coast of Norway, beneath the North Sea, lies the Troll Field, one of the richest areas for oil and gas deposits in the world. The challenge is to build a structure that can stand firm in the deep sea and against ferocious storms while providing a platform from which to tap the vast resources below the seabed. We've come to Bergen in Norway to go out to Troll A, a gas platform and the tallest concrete offshore platform in the world. The potentially dangerous journey out into the North Sea is only possible by helicopter, and so it's necessary to don a survival suit for the flight. The troll field lies 60 kilometers from the Norwegian coast, and the natural gas beneath it was created more than 130 million years ago. The immense amount of gas in the field meant that a permanent structure was needed, one that would stand in place and extract gas for over 50 years. And there it is. 
Isn't that fantastic? Four great concrete legs coming out of the sea. What a sight. The drilling deck and superstructure of Troll A sit on four massive concrete legs that reach down over 300 meters to the sea bed. The base of the platform is made up of 19 concrete cells that were built on land. The base was towed out by tugs and sunk into a deep fjord where the four towering legs were added. At 369 meters, each completed leg of Troll A is taller than the Eiffel Tower. The whole structure was then sunk further down into the deep fjord and the platform was aligned over the top using barges. Water was then pumped out of the structure, allowing it to float up a matter of centimetres to meet the platform. The completed structure was then refloated in preparation for the journey out to the Troll Field. The platform was towed out to sea, making it the largest structure ever to have been moved across the surface of the Earth. Up here on the helipad, I'm 76 metres above the sea. It's easy to forget that most of the structure is underwater. It's a bit like an iceberg. So right up at this height, I'm actually exactly the same height as the top of the Empire State Building. An offshore platform like this is really a chemical plant at sea. And because it's an industrial plant, that's why I'm wearing yet another set of protective clothing. Down there is the gas plant. And in the distance, the gray section is for processing the gas. And here in the middle is the drill rig. This new platform hasn't finished drilling all its production wells yet. There are going to be 39 in the end, down into the seabed, and then fanning out to a depth of about one and a half kilometers. They reach out for half a kilometre all round the platform. Above us are the drill stems, hanging like in a wardrobe, ready to be used. On average, it takes a month to drill each of the wells to extract gas. But what we're really interested in is what makes this structure stand up. And to do that, we need to go down to the seabed itself. The journey down to the bottom of the sea is by a lift inside one of the great legs. quiet, it's really eerie. You have the feeling that with the sea outside, you're just on another planet. On land, you see tall buildings, you see tunnels, you see other gigantic structures. But here, in this environment, the scale of this engineering and its achievements are really Extraordinary. You really feel there isn't anywhere on this planet or any other planet we couldn't go. The pressure of the sea outside, just outside the wall, is 30 times the pressure inside here at the bottom where I'm standing, trying to squash the leg like this. The reason it can't is a combination of the strength of the heavily reinforced concrete and the cylindrical shape, which is the most efficient shape to resist that sort of external pressure. Just the same principle as a submarine hull or an aircraft fuselage.
Down here, right at the very, very bottom of the platform, is where the pipelines turn the corner and head out over the seabed, taking the gas to Norway, 60 kilometers away, down there. And under my feet, there's a concrete floor, and under that is the mud. And the whole platform is embedded deep into the seabed. It's like a bunch of upturned coffee cups, 19 of them, and we're just in one of them. And they've been pressed into the seabed with the wall of the coffee cup pushed deep into the mud. And if you can imagine pushing a mug into mud, trying to pull it out, the suction inside holds it firmly in place. And that's exactly how this base works. Bit of a leak over there. Hope it's not too serious. No, it's just a leaky valve, really. Just collecting up some water. This might look like graffiti, but actually it's the visitor's book. And I've been invited to sign my name. I'm back on the main deck level, at the top of the concrete legs. Down on the seabed, the problem was to withstand the huge pressure of water. But up here, near the top, it's the forces from the wind and the waves pushing on the platform. It's a quiet day today, but in a storm, waves can reach the deck right up here, 30 meters above sea level. That must be pretty frightening but the deck is high enough to avoid being swamped by the waves and is securely attached to the four great concrete legs, which are strong and stiff enough in bending to withstand the estimated five million waves that crash onto them every year. It's structures like the great troll platform and the engineering advances behind them that give us the confidence to know that we can live and work alongside the sea, whatever the conditions. It's no longer a question of seeking refuge from it, but of knowing we can coexist on shore and in the deep oceans. In our next program, we look at arches. We start our story at a towering Roman aqueduct, the Pont du Gard in Nîmes, France, then witness the Gothic splendor of Cologne Cathedral in Germany and we travel across the country to explore the cavernous Lufthansa aircraft hangar in Hamburg, big enough to house three jumbo jets.